Welcome to the next in my series of studies on John's Gospel. There is a story about a, a scientist who was part of the uh, transformation and the harnessing of nuclear energy and uh, went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And he was asked what it was that made him become a scientist, what it made it what was that made him become a great scientist. And he talks about what his uh, mother would ask him when he got home from school as a small boy. Now she didn't ask him whether he'd been good. She didn't ask him whether what he had learned. She would ask him this, did you ask a good question today? And that was repeatedly what he was encouraged to do to learn to ask a good question, to learn to find out what he didn't already know, to think through what wasn't clear to him. Questions are an important thing. I always end these talks, always the sermons that I preach, I end with something called questions for reflection. I want to get people to think. Jesus asked over a hundred questions in the New Testament. It's really important to get ourselves to question what we think we know, what we think we feel, what might be going on under the surface of things, and to explore and to discover. We're looking at the teachings and writings of John, the disciple of Jesus, who is at this point telling us about the John the Baptist, who is picking up and using the teaching of Isaiah 40 to declare himself as the one who is preparing the way for the Messiah. He's gathered together some people who are following him, who he's baptizing, but he's very clear with them that he is not the Messiah and that the one who is to come is so great that he's not even worthy of untying their sandals. And when he meets Jesus, he sees the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus in the form of a dove, a representation, a sign to John that this is the one. And so he tells his disciples that the one who is before them is going to immerse them, submerge them, fill them, baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And all of these are in uh, our previous talks. You can look at them uh, wherever you look, listen to podcasts, uh, on iTunes, Spotify, wherever, or on our website, or on our YouTube channel, you can get the videos. Sutton Coldfield Baptist Church. And John says, I have seen and testify now that this is God's chosen one. That was all part of our last talk. We pick it up at what John 1.35. The next day, John was there again with his two disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And again, we've explored that phrase, Lamb of God, in full in one of our previous talks. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now note that these are two disciples of John the Baptist. And they go and follow Jesus. Now there is a literal sense of that. They probably started to walk after Jesus. But the, the, the use of the word follow and the word disciple implies something more than that. Because it was part of the culture at that time that there would be teachers who were respered and, uh, revered and respected who would gather followers. So what they says, when it says they follow Jesus, there is also another meaning that they were choosing to learn from Jesus. They were choosing that having learnt from John the Baptist, they would now go after and learn from Jesus. And to be a follower of someone meant that you went wherever he went and you learnt from them, you asked questions, you sat with them, you ate with them, and you would ultimately seek to copy them. You would do what they do. You would react and respond as they responded. You would learn their rule of life, if you like. And then you would therefore obey them. And what happens here is that the disciples of John the Baptist are obeying him because they have learned that he has been speaking about someone who was coming who was greater than him. And now that he's pointed out who that person is, they obey John the Baptist by seeking to follow Jesus. And that raises a question for us as to who we trust and obey and how we allow, who we allow to guide us. There are lots of voices in our world, lots of things on media, lots of uh, videos, lots of things we can follow. But they had sat with John the Baptist. They had watched how he responded. They knew his integrity. They didn't just see what he presented uh, uh, on a screen. They knew what was really his heart. And John uh, encouraged them to follow Jesus 
And that happens over three years. They follow Jesus, they watch him, they go where he goes, they see what he is doing. And to follow someone in a biblical sense, we need to trust them. We need to understand who they are. So please, please follow people you know that you know how they live, you know what they do. You can learn lots of things from people you don't know, but don't obey them. Don't trust everything you see and read until you've learned to trust the person. So these two set off after Jesus, and Jesus, it says, turning around, Jesus saw them, this is John 1, following and said, what do you want? Now. There is a double meaning to this question. On the one hand, he is simply asking them, what do you want? But the way the phraseology of the Greek in, 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 is, is that he's asking something deeper. He's saying, what are you looking for? What are you seeking after? What is it that you really want? And what I think he's trying to do is to get them to voice their expectations of following Jesus. What are their hopes and desires for life and what do they think following Jesus is going to do to help them meet their expectations and desires? And for a few moments, I'm going to ask the same of us. What is it that we really want and how might following Jesus meet our expectations? He's getting them to think through and voice their hopes. But like many of the questions that Jesus asks, the answer's too difficult to voice straight away. And one senses that they panic because when they say, when he says, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, uh, uh, where are you staying? That's not really what they want. They're, they're deflecting the question. And there are lots of times we deflect the question that Jesus asks us. But we need to spend time sitting with this question. What do you want? They don't know what to say, so they're kind of saying, when can we see you again? What can we do? There's a story about Confucius who is, meets a young emperor. And the young emperor asks Confucius, what is the single most important advice you can give me to rule my country? Now, I don't know what answer you would give, and maybe you're familiar with what Confucius says. It's alleged that Confucius says, define the problem. And that's a similar idea to ask a question. That in order to work out where we're going and what we're doing, we need to understand the difficulties. We need to understand the obstacles. In order to help other people, we need to understand their issues. To ask ourselves the question, what do we want? We need to define the problems that we have. Because what do we want is a really significant question because it determines what we do and that will determine what satisfies us. And that's really important to life, working out what's going to satisfy us and working out what we do to be satisfied, which comes from establishing what we really want. But we need to define the problem because there are a couple of issues. And the first issue is this, is that what we feel we want now in the moment may not be what we really want. So for example, most of us want to be thin and healthy and fit, but we also want to eat that extra chocolate, we want that cream, we want that pudding, we want that takeaway. What we want in the evening is often what we didn't want the next morning. And most of us live with that tension and that difficulty and that problem in that a lot of the time we do what we feel we want right now, and that's in, at odds against what we really, really want in the long term. Marriages are broken, not because people didn't really want long, stable marriages, but because in the moment they wanted a sexual experience and the next day there is a regret. What do we think we want in the long term and how is what we want right now in the moment damaging that? And the second issue is that what we think we want may not be satisfying because it's not what we really want. In other words, we may think we want some things that actually are illusory and are not helping us. I'm going to explain that a little bit more. To do that, let me just say this. What we probably all would agree that we want is happiness. But that's such a big, bland word. What do we mean by happiness? Well, we may want to define happiness as laughter. 
laughing is happy. But actually we know that there are times when we can find something important and find happiness even when we're not laughing. So we may want to define happiness as joy. But again, how do we understand what joy is? There are times when we can feel joy because of the substances or the things we are doing in the moment that the next day don't leave us with joy but leave us with regret or a headache or a hangover or shame or guilt or fear. So happiness is perhaps slightly different. Perhaps happiness would involve security, feeling safe at the absence of risk and everything is uh, protected. But another definition might involve the word contentment, which perhaps is more significant. We can feel safe but discontented. We can feel that we, nothing can harm us, but we wonder what the point is. So contentment is perhaps a more important part of happiness. We might want to call it peace of mind. Feeling at peace. Feeling satisfied. Now many of us would also want to throw in feeling loved as part of happiness, of people having people who love us and care for us and people who we love and care for. That is undoubtedly part of happiness. All these things are part of happiness. Part of the problem, of course, is that there may be times when we aren't able to feel loved because those who loved us have perhaps died or gone or we haven't yet met them. So perhaps a better way of looking at it is feeling valued. So we might want to define happiness as a peace of mind, a sense of joy that comes from feeling valued. William Arthur Ward said that happiness is an inside job. In other words, happiness is not something that is derived from other people. It's derived from our own attitudes. So that if we look for others to bring us happiness, we never really find it because we're always dependent on them. Happiness is something internal. So I want to explore what it is that we seek happiness from and ask the question whether those things bring peace of mind and whether they bring a feeling of value. The first thing that our culture encourages us to do is to seek happiness from things. From our clothes, from our shopping, from our houses, from our job, from our money, from our bank balance. That there is a strong belief that the more we have, the happier we will be. But of course, happiness doesn't come from things because we don't have peace of mind, because we're worried about that they're not good enough, that they break, that they may get stolen, that they're never quite as good as we wanted, that there's always something more we could have. And happiness from things doesn't bring a sense of feeling valued. We may be envied, but being envied isn't the same as being loved. Uh, arising other people's jealousy is actually quite uh, disturbing and, and, and doesn't bring us love. We may seek happiness from being admired, from being uh, valued, wanted, liked, popular for, by other people. And that, of course, does bring a sense of feeling value. If people like us, if we're popular, then, uh, of course, we are valued. But the problem with seeking happiness from what others think of us is that it doesn't bring peace of mind. It brings insecurity. It brings a fear that we may have said the wrong thing, that we may do the wrong thing, that that person doesn't really like us, that we're wearing the wrong clothes, that we're getting older, that we haven't fitted in, that we haven't conformed, that we don't go along with the group. And so we're continually anxious. Are we doing what others want? So it doesn't really bring happiness. We're asking ourselves the question, what do we want? And we've answered that we think we want happiness from peace of mind and feeling value. But the problem is that we may be seeking uh, what we really want from the wrong things. Not from things, not from admiration, neither from physical sensations, from sex, from drink, from food, from excitement, from thrill, from danger, from exercise. All of these things are good, perhaps in the right place and at the right time, but they don't bring peace of mind and they don't enable us to feel valued because they don't last. They're gone in the morning. They don't take away our underlying feelings. It may be that we seek 
uh, happiness, from removing risk, from building a, a life that we control, from ensuring that nothing can harm us, from building walls around our lives. And that may give us a sense of peace of mind that we've eliminated danger. But it doesn't help us to feel valued because it feels worthless. To have made our life as comfortable as possible ultimately feels pointless and robs us of value. So I want to suggest that Jesus suggests that what brings happiness is to love God and to love others. And that when we seek to follow Jesus and copy him and learn from him on how to love God and how to love others, and the two need to go together, there's a relationship of intimacy with God and hearing his voice and sensing his presence and knowing his joy and peace that has to outwork in the blessing and care and, and, and love towards others, that the two can't be separated, that you can't have one without the other, that either one without the other is equally dissatisfying. But that when we love God and love others, we do find peace of mind and we do discover that we are loved. Dennis Waitley said, happiness cannot be traveled to, owned, earned, worn or consumed. Happiness is the spiritual experience of living every minute with love, grace and gratitude. So questions. What do we want from this life? What do we want? And are we living towards that aspiration? What things have we thought would bring happiness but have been illusions? And what do we sometimes want now that has got in the way of what we really want? I want to take it just a little bit further in John because having asked the, these two men what they want and having them not having replied very well, he says, come. Come and you will see. Now again, there's this double meaning. There's the literal meaning. They had to just go where he was going, but also, and they would see where he was living, but also they were going to come and see what life was about. So they went and saw where he was staying and they spent a day with him and it was about four in the afternoon. And I want to leave us with some reflections. You see, Jesus says, come. He says, come and spend time with him. Let's spend time with him in scripture, studying how he responds, studying what he says, learning what he says, taking on board what he says, learning his words and his actions. Let us spend time in the Bible with him and let that transform us, that we might copy that. Let us spend time in prayer, talking to him, writing to him, speaking out loud, walking with him, sharing our hopes, sharing our fears, sharing our doubts, sharing our questions, sharing our needs. And let us then seek to act it out, to copy him. Spending time with Jesus means choosing to be merciful and compassionate and truthful and generous and gracious and loving our enemies. And spending time with Jesus means spending time in worship, in singing, in thanksgiving, in wonder, in awe, in praise. And as we do that, we will discover some things. Here's three things to leave us with. We discover a treasure that lasts. In Matthew 6 verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Don't store up things that you leave behind in this world that cannot be taken into the next. But verse 20, Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. What are those? Th what is treasure in heaven? Well, it is the relationship with Jesus and it is the people he calls us to love and invest in because we take with us the people we have impacted for him. We can take them into heaven with us. We can see them again and reunite and relearn. So we invest in people. And John says, for where your treasure is, will your heart also be? If we put our heart into the job, or we put our heart into our bank balance, or we put our heart into our possessions, or we put our heart into our hobbies, then we lose out. But if we put our heart into the people we work with, 
or our heart into the people we invite into our homes or our heart into the people we share our possessions with or our heart into the people we do our hobbies with then we have a treasure that lasts forever and secondly this life is found in serving in serving and blessing others. Mark 8, 34, whoever wants to be my disciple, Jesus says, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And then we say, Donald, how can self-denial be life? Well, we discover the great paradox of life, that when we put others before our own needs, we are blessed more. For he says in verse 35, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save. In other words, when we build walls to protect ourselves and make everything safe and easy for ourselves, we shrivel inside and don't find life. But when we lay ourselves open to others to care and to bless and to strengthen and to nurture, then we find life. What good is it, he says, to gain the whole world, to have all the money, all the possessions, all the popularity, all the power in the world, yet forfeit our soul? because we did not love and we discover finally that this love transforms john 15 and verse 9 as the father has loved me so have i loved you now remain in my love stay in the love of jesus stay in relationship for that is life and he says, if you keep my commands, verse 10, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. And I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We want complete joy. What do you want, he says of us? We say we want complete joy. And he says that comes from remaining in Jesus and obeying his commands. And what is his command? love each other john 15 12 my command is this love each other as i have loved you this is life what do you want we want happiness and we want it from learning to love the lord our god and to love our neighbor we want to have happiness from remaining in jesus and loving one another let's pray lord help us to love you walk with you, listen to you, and serve you. Help us to invest in the treasure of people we can meet again in heaven. Let our lives be, the, be in the, let our hearts be in the people you call us to bless. Help us to find life in the sacrifice of service. Protect us from seeking to gain the world and lose our souls. Help us to remain in your love. Help us to keep your command to love. And may our joy be complete. We ask in Jesus' name and in the power of his spirit that we might be filled. Amen. What do we want from this life? What things have we thought would bring happiness but have been illusions? What do we sometimes want now that has got in the way of what we really want?